let's go into the problem of coins, using coins. Let's use some evidence to support what we're saying. Why are coins important? Well, the Lydians were the ones that introduced it in 600 BC. They were used for more than just commerce. Coins created and maintained a ruler's identity. Maybe they didn't have TV or internet or newspapers or radio. And so when they came to power, they needed something to introduce themselves to all the people. Coins were great because everybody would be handling them. And you can see who your new ruler is. Since everybody used them, a ruler knew that the best way to introduce himself was to mint new coins. What was on a coin? Well, they bore the image of the ruler. Now, hold on. In Islam, you can't have images. But yet, these coins from the 7th century all have images on them. And what they would do, uh, they uh, they would also put the name or the religion that uh, their identity belonged to. And the date was placed on. So they put their name, they would put their face, and they would delineate what religion they belonged to. These were then minted in the different mints in their empire. That's why we need to look at coins. Coins are great because they're made out of metal. They don't deteriorate. They don't disintegrate. Problem for the numismatists who are looking at the coins from the 7th century is that many of them are looking at these coins. They're, they're having a problem because they're trying to impose the Islamic tradition, the standard Islamic narrative on these coins, and they're just not making any sense. That's why they have many of them are now having to reassess and look just at the coins. I've been asking many numismists who've contacted me in the last three years, please stop imposing the Islamic traditions on the coins. Just read the coins. Tell me what you find. And that's why we need to look at the coins. Dispense with the Islamic traditions. The task of any numismatist or a historian is to read what they're finding in front of them from the time period and the place that we are looking or are curious. Now, the numismatists lament that there doesn't seem to be any coins at all from the Hijaz, where all this is taking place. Interesting, right? When you look at the mints, now these are the mints uh, that, according to Islamic tradition, should be down in Mecca and Medina, because that's where the caliphs, they were living in Medina. They were ruling from Medina. They controlled from Turkey in the north down to what is Yemen today in the south from uh, what is Tripoli in the West, all the way over to Afghanistan in the East. All that land was under control. They had the mints. They were the ones producing the coins. Their names should be on them. Their faces should be on them. Something Islamic should be on all these coins. No mints whatsoever down that far south. Look at the mints and look and see where they are. Where are the mints? Tartus, Hims, Balbe, Dimash, Tebaria, Abilia. Baisan, Jerash, Amman, Yumna, and Ilya. Those are where the mints are in the West. That's up in Lebanon, in Jordan, and in Syria, and in what is today Israel. Too far north, 600 to 1,000 to 1,200 miles too far north. Now, the ones in the east are in, in Susa, Dash, Bishapur, Harajan, Tanbuk, Khazarun, Istakhar, Darabjir, Ararshar, Kura, and Kavad Kura. I'm desecrating the language, my, my apologies. But those are all in what is today Iran and Iraq too far to the east and too far north again. Nothing from Mecca and Medina. And why? Well, possibly because no one was living that far south. We don't have any reference, as we saw before, of Mecca. And there's no water down there. So there's no people, no people, no towns, no towns, no cities, no cities, no civilization, no history, as I said last week. So it's obvious when you look at the map that all of these mints would have been under the authority of an Arab leader or caliph in the 7th century, including any Muslim caliph, yet none of these mints were from the Hijaz. Instead, they were all situated too far north. So let's use a timeline and look and see what we find about the coins. Muhammad dies, but there are no coins. No Islamic coins exist during his time, nor during the entire Rashidun period. There is nothing Islamic about any coins from 624 to 661. Oh, there are coins. We know in the Sassanid Empire there are coins. These are Arab coins, and yet, but they're all Christian. Take a look. These are the coins that are coming from that era and from those places. Notice there is a picture of the rulers, but they're all holding crosses. All the coins from 622, 624 up to 661 are Christian. None of them are Muslim. Why would, if it was a Muslim, they would have names like Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and I. No names, those four names don't exist at all. No one called Muhammad exists on those coins. 
When we get to the time of Mu'awiyah in 661, so now we're 30 years after Muhammad died, after the caliphate was introduced, he then introduces his coins. And here you see, here he is. There is a picture of, of Mu'awiyah with a cross above his head. He's holding a cross. There you can see him on the right, and that's a very famous coin. He has a cross above his head. If you look at the one on the far right, there's the name Muhammad below the cross, below the M with the cross above it. Muhammad is the name for Muhammad, the praised one. That's what it means. So who is the praised one here? That's well, not Muhammad the prophet, obviously. Who do you think that is? Who is? Well, everybody called himself the praised one. Those are his coins. Over in the east, he introduces these coins, uh, then they have the Zoroastrian fire altar on them, suggesting very clearly that nothing Islamic whatsoever on any of these coins. I just want to show you this inscription that we have put together. Here is an inscription in Taif, and it's in, written in Greek and in Aramaic, not in Arabic. Well, that's interesting. It dates to around 663, and notice there's a cross right there. A cross. What's a cross doing on a Muslim inscription? And there's the reference to Mu'awiyah, the servant of God and the commander of the believer. What God and what believers? Well, look at the cross. He is a Christian. He is not a Muslim. The Umayyad material, uh, uh, caliph, the first of the Umayyad caliphs, was not a Muslim at all. That, and that is not till we get then to Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik introduces the coin on the right. On the left, you see the Byzantine coins. On the right, he does he mimics the Byzantine coins and mocks them, takes the cross off their orbs, take and desecrates the Byzantine cross on the back side. Uh, Justinian II goes to war with him because of that coin, loses the war. Abdul Malik wins the war and introduces this coin with a picture of himself holding a sword. Here you see the Shahada is introduced. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. There is only one God, but God and Muhammad is the praised one with a mockery of the Byzantine cross on the back side. That's in 693. So he's still on the coin. His image is on the coin. His name is on the coin. And then finally, he introduces these coins in 696. These coins, I don't have time to unpack it. They are all reference against and attacking Jesus Christ. Say not three, God is one and he has no son. For God does not begetteth, nor is he begotten. There is only one God, but God and the praise one, of course, who is the praise one in this case? It would be Jesus because it's all attacking Jesus. It's attacking his divinity, attacking his trinity, uh, attacking the sonship of Jesus. Say not three, say, uh, say not three, for God is one. And then, of course, he says the praise one is nothing more than the messenger. That's introduced on 696 and all the coins after 696 that have those nomenclatures. So can you see, as we're looking at this, you can tell, just look at the review here. You can see all of this has to do with the sequence of how then Islam was finally introduced, possibly sometime during the reign of Abdul Malik or later. Why do I say it later? Well, let's go to the inscriptions, the rock inscriptions. See, the rock inscriptions, like the coins, are great because they don't disintegrate. They don't deteriorate. You can see the writing on them. You can read the writings on them. Notice where the rock inscriptions are found in the 7th century. They're way up in the north in Jordan or Yemen in the south. Nothing in the middle. Those, pick, those ones that you see in the middle are all from the 8th, 9th, and 10th century. The earliest ones in the 7th century are either too far north or too far south. Again, following the same problem we saw with Mecca when our fir first talk. Now, the most famous inscription is the one I just told you about, the Mu'awiyah. Here you have him, and he talks about himself. He gives his name there as a servant of God. Obviously, he's not, there's nothing Islamic in any of these inscriptions. It's all about the believers, that's the Christian believers, and this, him being a servant of God. Ilka Lindstedt has done the most work on the inscriptions. Uh, he wanted to look at, uh, he looked at 100 rock inscriptions. Actually, he's looking, he, there are 30,000 of these inscriptions, but he wants, he looked at the most famous ones, 100 rock inscriptions dated from 640 to 740. That's that 100 year period, just after the time of, if Muhammad did exist, when he would have died, up until the time when the Abbasids were about to take over. So it's during the Umayyad period. He noticed that prior to 690, there were no evidence of anything Islamic on the inscriptions. Except for formula, everything comes after 690. 
after 690, between 690 and 710, the name of the prophet Muhammad begins to appear as a person rather than just a title, the praised one, because that's what Muhammad means. It's not a name. It's a title in Arabic, means the praised one. It becomes the name of a person around that time. Look at that's the late 7th century going into the 8th century. From 710 to 720, you start starting to see the Muslim rites start to appear, like the pilgrimage and the prayer and the fast. And then it's not until 720 to 730 that the names Muslim as a people and Islam as a specific group begin to appear in contradistinction to Christianity. Folks, that's 100 years after Muhammad. Are you seeing the dates? We're well into the 8th century before we finally see a Muslim entity or an Islamic religion start to really take shape. And it's the beginning of the Umayyad dynasty just leading up into the beginning of the Abbasid in dynasty. It was only in the 730s onwards that there is evidence of a popular devotion to Muhammad as a prophet and messenger, which makes the Islamic traditions incredibly awkward. Furthermore, there is a hundred years silence prior to this that indicates that Islam did not exist as a distinct religion until long after the time of Muhammad, which casts doubt on whether he had any part in starting Islam. I want to just put at this inscription here, which just came out. I put it up three weeks ago already. Uh, 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 I don't even know how many we've had. Uh, if you look at, we've had over hundred, almost uh, over 160,000 people have looked at this video in just the last three weeks. That inscription is from Taif. It's above Mecca. It's in that one of the st stations along the Western Plateau. And this inscription, it was written in 697 to 698. It's an important inscription because it says this was written in the year of the Mustil al Haram was built in the 78th year. The Mustil al Haram is where the Kaaba is. That's that area where the Kaaba sits right in the middle of Mecca. And it's saying that it was built. That means the whole area, including the Kaaba, was built in 78th year. 78th year means what? The 78th year from the Hijrah, which would be 622 which may put, put it around 697 to 698. That's enormously damaging because that suggests, therefore, that the Masjid al-Haram was built at that time. Now, Muslims are trying to push back by saying it means rebuilt. No, those are two different words. The word built is bunia. And that's what's written on the inscription on the rock. It is ueda bina wuha would, would have to, it would mean rebuilt, and that's not written on the rock there. Thus, it was constructed during the time of Abdul Malik, who ruled from 685 to 705, and not at the time of Adam Eve, as Muslims like to tell us, or even during the time of Abraham, and certainly not even at the time of Muhammad. This is really damaging. Go see the video that has been put up on this. Conclusions. We need to come to conclusions so that we can wrap it all up. When all is said and done, the Premise, where is there any evidence for Muhammad in the seventh? That's what we're asking. Remember, that's what we want to ask. Now, the coins prove that there is no evidence of Muhammad or the Quran or a city called Mecca or of people called Muslims or of any religion called Islam until 692, which is 60 years too late, at least from the historical perspective. The 30,000 rock inscriptions, which have been researched so far, all of which are north and not in the Hijaz, show that prior to 690 AD, there is nothing Islamic in any of them. And that an evolution of Islamic thought and practice can be noted between 690 and 730. That is way too late. That's 60 to 100 years after Muhammad died. Much too late to support the Islamic traditions. All of the 7th to 8th century references to Muhammad. I didn't get into this today because we don't have time. But if you look at Thomas the Presbyter or Sabaeus in 670s or John Bar Benkeia in 690 or John Nikiu in 690s and John of Damascus in 730. So there are reference to this name or this title called Muhammad, well known. But they are all from way too far north. They place this Muhammad way up in Damascus and in Gaza and as far away as Kufa in the east. Thus, therefore, they're referring to another Muhammad, or they are all written way too late to be worthy because they are not written in the 7th century. The Astanami letter is a 16th century forgery. It's there in the monastery 
St. Catherine's Monastery, redacted back to Muhammad by monks in the St. Catherine's Monastery in order to protect themselves from the surrounding Muslim horde. So it's a 16th century forgery. The constitution of Medina, the Muslims pushed for it to prove Muhammad exists, is not from Muhammad at all, but was created by Ibn Isham in 833 and then redacted back to Muhammad. The doctrine of Iyakobi has nothing to do with Muhammad, but is about another man from that time, possibly Umar, who is well known, and he is the one that takes over Jerusalem, but he is a Jew from Hira, which is in Iraq today, too far north, wrong religion, and the wrong place. The four references to Muhammad in the Quran really only refer to the Blessed One. We haven't time to look at the Quran, but they are in almost three, and uh, there's only four references to his name in the Arabic, and they could be almost anyone. In fact, three of them possibly could be referring to Jesus himself. The references to Muhammad on the Dome of the Rock, the Blessed One, could either be referring to Jesus or a person named Muhammad or even to Abdul Malik because of the time and the reference. Now, a final thought. Initially, when asked previously in a 1995 debate with Dr. Jamal Badawi, what was our proof for suspecting that Muhammad, the Muhammad of the ninth century, our only recourse or my only recourse was to note the late dates for the Islamic traditions, the first part of this talk. That's the Siddha Hadith Hatafsir and Tahik, pointing out that they didn't exist until two to three hundred years after the fact. That's all I had to go on. His response was that we are only arguing from silence and that the absence of evidence does not prove the evidence of absence, which shut down the debate back in 1995. I couldn't go any further than that. But see, that was 1995. Today, in 2023, we are no longer arguing from silence. As the 7th century evidence against the 9th century Muhammad living in the 7th century is huge and growing so that the burden of proof has finally flipped. We now have coins. We have rock inscriptions. We have buildings. We also have manuscripts. That's for next our next talk. And as finally the Muslims and their advocates who are now the ones who are the ones who are now arguing from science. They are the ones who are going to have to tell us where is the evidence. We have the evidence, finally. We're not arguing from silence. In fact, everything they're saying now argues from silence. Consequently, every time they make a claim for their ninth century Muhammad, all we have to do is ask six simple words. Prove it from the seventh century. Prove it from the seventh century. Now, the importance of Muhammad. Islam is dependent on the book, the place, and the man. When you begin to confront the man, Muhammad, and other, the other two begin to wobble. If you destroy the man, Muhammad, the other two are then destroyed as well. So therefore, when we cast doubt on Islam, as we're doing in this talk today, we can get, introduce our Muslims to a better book, a better man, Jesus Christ. Let's bring them home.